Hello everyone and welcome to Erudite's Shockwave Talks. I'm Janine Ramirez. I'm a people-first advocate at Erudite, a people-first AI for HR built by psychologists and data scientists to empower a better employee experience. So at Erudite, we love learning, and this webinar series called Shockwave Talks is our way of learning from experts and sharing insights with all of you. So thank you very much for joining us today to explore the future of work, the future of workforces and how HR can adapt so we are not left behind. Um, before I introduce our guest, I just want to quickly go over some reminders. One, time is precious, so we'll keep everything within one hour. Um, please make use of the chat to ask any questions and share your experiences anytime throughout the webinar. I'll read them out for you when we pause for questions. Um, the more the merrier, so please invite your colleagues to join the conversation right now. Sharing is caring. And lastly, if you have time today to help our product team out with their research, we'd appreciate if you could fill out a quick, quick survey linked in the chat. I'm going to send it there in the chat, and I'll tell you more about it after the talk. But now, let us get to it. I am super, super honored to introduce Wagner Denuso, who was a clinical psychotherapist turned HR and future of work pro with over 20 years of experience in executive coaching, HR strategy, and organizational development and transformation and everything you need to know. He's got it. So welcome to Shockwave Talks, Wagner. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you so much, Janine. And I love being people first. I think that's why we're all here. Because you said that so many things are changing. The workforce, workplace, everything is changing. But one thing that's not changing is that people, all people, want to be emotionally connected to others. They want to know that they have a purpose. And they want to know that they can trust the communities they belong to. So we are going to talk about HR and the future of HR. I think everybody's hearing about the need for us to adapt. You said not to be left behind. I think that's true, Janine. We can be um, in a, a lagging indicator of the workforce. We have to be a leading indicator of where we are taking the workforce. And to start, let's start by, let me share with you the context. I yes, think the, yes. the next slide, please. The... The next slide. Yes, I am a speaker, a coach, an advisor. I've been advising a lot of startup companies, and I can tell a little bit about how flexible, how agile, and how adaptive these new companies are. In fact, the HR groups for these small companies, I've been talking to a lot of them, they are thinking creatively. Uh, I give an example because it goes right into this. Uh, the idea that actually you might not need to know HR to be an effective HR leader. What you need is the capabilities to lead the business where we need them to lead. And with that, one of the companies that I was working with, they decided to get a digital strategist instead of HR partner. What they need is a digital strategy to make things very uh, available to everybody. So you can see the HR is changing. And even the capabilities we bring to the table are changing. But look at the context we are in. I like the idea that context becomes our compass. Because so many times, and not because we intend to do this, but so many times we just follow the neighbors. We do benchmarking. We do those things that says, oh, they are doing this. We should do it the same. Actually, you have no basis to say that's going to work for you if it's not within your context. Context is really important. Maturity levels in your organization, all this matters. So when I think about your strategic priorities, do you have them very clear? Your industry, industry shifts. Uh, Josh Burson has told us that actually companies are betting on different capabilities across the industry, like Walmart, for example, doing financial services um, or healthcare. So you can see that there is a blend of capabilities, no matter what industry you are. Competitive landscape, are you there to grow market share, which is very hard to do right now, or you're there to disrupt and create new offerings that's going to leave everybody behind? So all this matters to the business. But look at HR. HR has to make leadership ready for the future ready organization. 
HR has to think about the workplace design in a different way. Hybrid, flexible, asynchronous work. All this matters. It matters a lot because that's how you create value for the organization. And last but not least, skills. If I ask all of you, is it possible that we got skills right? I don't think we did it yet. I think it's, it's possible to get there, but I will talk to you about how important it is to think about the digital ecosystem and value-driven outcomes. So next slide. Now that we know the context, the context is very complex. I love this slide because I think we, it's a mantra. Clarity creates capacity. Clarity is so important to all of us. Why? Because people are saying they don't have capacity right now to learn. They don't have capacity to do new things. They don't have capacity to think about what's next for their business. Because we are not very clear about the strategic intent. Sometimes you're not very clear in the direction you're taking your people. So it's very important for us to be very clear because the time that you spend perfecting PowerPoints for two hours a day because you don't know exactly what's expected, the time you spend chit-chatting with everybody, trying to figure out what's happening in the company. So I would say you could shave about six to eight hours a week just by being more clear with your people and transparent about the strategy and about where you're going and building trust on the way there. Next slide. I think it's important to know the workforce has changed. If nobody told you, I think you already felt it. I think the workforce today is what I like to call the five Ds. They are distributed. No matter how much you want to call them back into the office, you can spend your whole voice trying to bring people back to where you live. But if they have no interest in being there, they are going to continue to do a flexible arrangement. And I think the key word here is flexibility. Work-life harmonization is playing a, a, a role here. People are taking care to really pay attention to their accountabilities in their personal life, their professional life, their ambition, their aspirations. But we need to be comfortable with the idea that actually no matter what, even if they go co-located, we are not going to find all these skills in the same place for people to be co-located. If you want a diverse organization, if your offices are in the most expensive cities in the world, you're not going to be diverse. <laughs> I think it's an illusion that we can really concentrate this diversity and inclusion in one place when geography dictates who lives there, who doesn't live there. So let's get used to the idea that we're going to find skills in remote areas. We're going to find the diversity in different places. And the workforce is distributed. They are dynamic. That's another thing that, going back to Janine, let's not be caught left behind here. HR has the illusion sometimes. <laughs> I'm being very honest because I've seen it. We have the illusion that our nine blocks, everything that we do is for the long-term uh, identification of leaders, pipeline, leadership pipeline is important. I'm not saying that's not. But the population is dynamic. You only have three years in the life cycle that we used to think was like five to 10 years, 15 years. The life cycle of an employee is like the half-life of skill. Half-life of skill is three years, right? That's why upskilling is not working that well because it goes out of date very quickly. Think about your population you're bringing in. You're bringing great talent, great early career folks who are thinking that the first year, they need to feel that they belong where you hired them to be. They need to feel the connection. So you have one year to really connect those people to the network in your culture and show that they can trust it. The second year is all about showing that you are serious about providing opportunities for growth. So you have to show that the, you're equipped to give them resources to learn, grow, and advance. The third year, they're really thinking, what's next for me? What's my next role? If you're not ready to provide that through a talent marketplace or something, those people are going to look into the option number two, which is I leave this company, I make more money because compensation has risen to number one topic. Uh, in conversations and the most important in the priority list of employees. I know the market has changed. I know that layoffs are becoming part of our daily life. I know all this. 
but things are so cyclical and it's changing so quickly. Opportunities for early talents that's really talented and skilled are plenty. Trust me, you have three years to convince those people that they belong where you hire them to be. And that's when you start identifying if they are your leadership pipeline on the third year. Digital. Of course, they are digital. We are digital. We are streamlining. We're streaming from a, from a platform right here. I think most HR organizations are a little behind already without a digital HR strategy. Because think about, I, I wrote a, an article the other day, and a lot of people resonate with that, a lot of people. I just ask, do your employees really know where to find things when they need to activate a process, when they need to do a termination, when they need to do performance management, when they need to do a leave of absence? Do they know where to go really to find where they need to go? It's very hard right now. We think that the proliferation of PDFs uh, if you have Microsoft in your organization, you know, the, the SharePoint pages, we start proliferating and there is no knowledge management or content management. HR needs to start thinking about content manager, content, content management, because it's critical to create a platform where employees and managers and leaders can go and they know where to find things because you have a strategy for your digital platforms. So the employee experience is a digital platform. You have to start thinking that way. Diverse. Um, of course, we are diverse. No matter what you do, the workforce out there is growing diversity because especially in the United States, when you look at the demographics, what are the demographics that are growing the fastest? The Hispanics are growing very fast. The Blacks are growing fast. And we are giving more opportunities. We are diverse no matter what. And I will go one step farther. We are diverse in thought, leadership. We are diverse in the way we think. We are diverse the way we love each other. Some And the, the whole idea that people have multiple identities is really important. So when you think about the dynamics of identities, how many dimensions one person brings to the workplace? So right there, you can see that one size never fits all, never. But HR has the tendency to use the same tools, the same process, and the same narrative for everyone. So we are a little um, not in sync. Let's put it that way. Discerning. The last thing I say is don't underestimate the intelligence of your people. You hire the best people in the market. When you start, now people are talking about gas lighting. When you're saying you're flexible, but you want everybody back in the office. When you start saying that, you know, people first and you start laying off everybody. When you're saying that there is opportunity to grow and you're committed to diversity and inclusion and nobody in the senior leadership looks like you. Those things matter. And I think employees are really discerning. Now they're asking questions. They're asking questions. Hey, how do you make decisions in this organization? Hey, how do you work with self-managed teams? Hey, how do you train your managers? Those are good questions in an interview. Um, how well trained they are. And they're discerning about, am I going to get into a full-time role or should I be an independent contractor? Should I be in what we are calling the open talent market? So talent acquisition is moving towards talent access because we have all these types of talent models that you can tap into and the skills are everywhere. So... You can see that the workforce has changed dramatically. So guess what? We need to change too. Next slide, please, because this is our goal, a frictionless employee experience. Why? Beyond engagement surveys, beyond all these things that we do to try to find out really how our people are doing, you need to think that you need to create a workforce ecosystem that works. You know, they have to have access to the resources to do their work. Um, I was talking to a company that was introducing ease of doing business in the company as a metric that we use for customers, right? NPS and ease of doing business with your organization. You should use for your employees. How easy it is to accomplish everything you ask them to accomplish? Not easy. <laughs> I bet it's not easy. And the sense of belonging, the idea that they can connect freely with anyone they want, no hierarchical power trips and 
this frictionless employee experience is the secret sauce of companies in the future. Next slide, please. Before we go, yes. to the side, can we go back? Because yes, there are so many interesting points that we need to kind of absorb. Like I know, yes. Wagner, for you, it's like, you know, this is your truth. But for, for <laughs> us, there are just like some things that we need to Perfect. kind of Perfect. like sift through. And you mentioned about like clarity in objectives. And like one of the questions we always get in, in these events is, like, how can we align the organizational objectives with HR's objectives? Like, in, in your experience, are they usually aligned or are they at odds? Like, leadership and HR, the organization and HR. <laughs> That's a great question. And I, the other day I wrote this sentence, I wrote, no, I read this sentence. Frustration is a misalignment of expectations. I forgot who said that, but it's awesome, isn't it? Frustration is a misalignment of expectations. So what expectations do we have of our HR partners? They're closest to the leaders. They're closest to the dialogue that happens in the senior leadership teams when they talk about strategy. How close are we really? Are we listening or are we talking or are we just pushing process on them? We need to be very honest about this because we need to step back. To go fast, you have to slow down. I truly believe in that. You slow down and start focusing on what matters the most. I think HR does not have the time to prioritize because we're always running and solving problems. We yeah. need that ability to step back and start talking to the business. And I've been in companies that do this well. What are the capabilities you're trying to build to be competitive? That's the conversation you have with business leaders. Tell me about the capabilities you are building to be more affordable in the marketplace. Tell me about the capabilities that you wish you could build, but you don't have the skills or the talent to do so. That's the conversation that leads to understanding where the business leaders are. And then you bring back to discuss how might we upskill, reskill, or build an organizational design that fits the capabilities and is a value-driven conversation. So it's not simple but it's not that difficult it's about having value-driven conversations that's okay. the shift in hr and i'm sure we'll we'll learn a little bit more yes. about how like hr can communicate that to leadership later on but i wanted to ask a little bit um about the five d's of the new workforce yes. that you that you mentioned so i mean there was the whole pandemic do you think like how did the pandemic help shape the, the current workforce and the future workforce? Do you think that this was kind of a natural progression already, like the natural evolution of the workforce? Or did the pandemic kind of change the, the course of the workforce? You know, Janine, I think this now is not just a matter of saying what is the impact, what happened, the numbers. Forget about the numbers for now. Being a psychotherapist in the past and now I'm still licensed and I keep thinking about why is it happening now this mental health crisis why it's so elevated still when the pandemic feels like it was in the past we need to understand that emotional reactions true emotional reactions come after events have passed because during the events we are trying to survive the past three years, we just focus on surviving, keeping our jobs, keeping our family safe. And I think we didn't allow our minds to relax, to experience the impact that we had. So what you're seeing in 2023 and 2024 is the residues of the emotional impact of going through traumatic experiences. It was very traumatic for most of us. Well, for all of us, I, uh, people who think, oh, it's not traumatic to me. Yes, yeah, it was easy to be home. It was great to be home with loved ones and dogs and all that. But that's just us holding on to something that makes us feel like, okay, it's okay. We can survive. So from survival mode to engaging the future, now we are experiencing the impact. And I think that's the huge piece that we are missing. We are already talking about the business. We're already talking about things that actually we are trying to avoid the conversation of pain 
in emotional pain nobody wants to talk to or about. And that's what we are experiencing right now. The emotional pain is on the surface, underneath the surface. We need to pay attention. We're still processing it, yeah. right? <laughs> Maybe we don't know the effect yet. Yeah, exactly. The year that Exactly. Okay, great. I'm going to save my other questions for later. Yes, okay. Like you're going to be tackling them in your next few slides. That is much more. So bring the questions. I think this was important because we settled the idea that the workforce is being impacted by so many forces, the unemployment, the big change, the resignations, all the trends that we've seen in the last 18 months feels like it keeps changing every three months. So next, I want to talk to you about what you can do in HR to start establishing a system where actually we take digital transformation seriously because the business already went through this. Remember in the last 10 years, the business has said business is a platform now because everything's in the cloud. We have to rely on ecosystems. We have to rely on partners and the AI and all the technologies that came up is to help the customer experience. Now we are talking about the employee experience and how to make it very viable. I'm sure you all have systems of record. I like to, to create this strategy in three systems. Systems of record are the systems that you need to build as an architecture for our accurate and consistent data. Designing APIs. Other mistake that I see very often right now is that, oh, we should put everything in this system because we put so much money in this system. Let's make everything there. Wrong, because actually the capabilities of the big guys might not follow the needs that you have in your company. So you have to pay attention. What is the demand that you need? What kind of solutions do you need? Because the solutions are everywhere. I mean, I'm working with so many startups that are doing fantastic work that through APIs, you can connect the dots. But don't think put all your eggs in one basket because that basket is not going to give you the eggs cooked. Actually, the eggs are going to be raw and it's going to take time. Anyway, so develop self-service workforce boards. On the systems of record, imagine AI, chat GPT coming up and you eliminate all this need for content management that's very crazy right now. Everything, all the content is there. ChatGPT can answer all the questions. Generative uh, technology is going to be taking care of a lot of the, what I call direct access. You stop calling shared services because people don't like that. But when you introduce to managers that actually you will have direct access to the functions and the information and the process that you need, they are very happy. I've been in organizations that did that. People prefer to get it done then waiting for a phone call from an HR partner to give them links to go to the same place that they could find. So leave it at that. Systems of record, accurate information, consistent information that can be shared with the finance and others. Systems of insights. Many companies believe that they already have the analytics that they need, but actually let's not confuse reporting with the analytics. Analytics is predictive. Analytics is more than descriptive. Descriptive analytics is basically reporting. And as somebody said recently, and I love, I use that all the time, that is like milk. After two weeks, might not be good for you anymore. So data has to be in the flow of work, has to be immediately consumed, understood, so you can create hypotheses to address with analytics. So design a talent strategy where you organize your tools for the insights that you want to get. What kind of strategy do you have for the talent? And what is your hypothesis in the current data that you have? Then you build the hypothesis and go for analytics. Because to be honest, I don't know how many of you, to be totally honest, how many of you are really benefiting from the analytics that you have today? You're benefiting because the leaders say, oh, that's great. I have all the numbers in my possession now. Can you tell me about this? Can you tell me about that? And then becomes this game of like, can you tell me about it? There is no activity that leads to a different outcome. That's what you need a system of insights for, is to do trending, hypothesis, and be more predictive. Systems of engagement, that's where we trip. We all trip on this. That's what I was thinking. 
imagine if your intranet is not your intranet because probably it's more confusing than that. You need a system of engagement. How do you engage your employees, managers, and leaders in one platform digitally? How do you co-create this interconnected system? How do you create a two-way system where people are talking to us, talking to leaders, talking to each other? Where do you enable this ecosystem to be fully digital? So collaboration happens faster. Connections happen. Conversations are cross-functional and cross-level because the hierarchy has to disappear a little bit. So I hope this helps the clarity of your strategy for digital HR. Next slide, please. Because now we have to talk about... Sorry, can I go back to yes, the, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. the process? It's like, okay, there's a lot. And like just like the basic... Um, employee experience, like we're, we're hearing a lot about employee experience now. Um, but if we think about it, like we should have been focused on this like years and years and years ago, right? Like, why do you think it took so long for HR to transition from something more administrative, like administrative work to actually being like designers of a fulfilling work experience? Janine, I, I think this is an important piece. I, I'm very empathic towards our leaders in the business who are trying to figure out what's the way forward. I'm very empathic towards our HR leaders who did their best to set up the operational, um, the operating model. Let's think about that. You know, you need accurate information. You need to be compliant. You need to think about all the risks that you need to avoid. So HR, in this incredible wave of change in the last 10 years, has been focusing on how can we structure things in a way that we minimize risks and create value for the organization. I understand that. The problem is that we are not dynamic enough. And I think that's what you're talking about. You know, I think we are lagging behind the employee experience because we are focusing on the business, we are focusing on the customers, we are focusing on the skills that we need to have. I think now it's time to focus on the individuals and give them the tools and the opportunities to co-create reality. When you think about employee experience, think about organizational culture. I think employee experience is to the individual what organizational culture is for the organization. The employee experience is a personalized sense of how it feels to be part of this community. Workforce is a community. So the employee experience is a shared accountability between the employer and the employee, where actually they can create the best way to use their skills, feel that they are productive in their purpose-driven goals, and actually grow their career, their intellect, and start feeling that actually there is a dynamic talent strategy that fuels that energy. I think it's about energy. Um, unfortunately, our leaders don't have that much time to spend with all the population that they, they lead. But I think leaders have to spend more time with people and start creating projects, missions. They are co-created by employees that let them do it. Because I've been in companies like this. If you let employees give the input, and solve for the dilemmas and problems that we give to them. And then we give them permission to fail, permission to try something new as an MVP, minimum viable product. The problem that we have today is that leaders even say, oh, this is a program for you. You're going to have hands-on on this. But then you have to present to senior leaders who say, no, we are not going to do it. That's not co-creating. Co-creation is giving people the power. So what I say is true. Distributed teams require distributed power. If the leaders are not sharing power, we are not going to move forward. That's a great way to look at like ex employee experience and work culture and also like empowerment within organizations. And I like one of one of the things I, I thought of right now is, you know, like in the past, HR couldn't really focus on that because there was so much to do. But thanks to technology, it kind of, you know, leads them to or, or gives them more time to focus on what really matters. And I know that's what's coming up next. So I'm yes. going to let you that's it, that's go it. To it. So next slide. Let's talk about that. Because look, ChatGPT, uh, you know, I asked them, how can HR be automated? But I did it on purpose because ChatGPT is limited. 
it gives you a sense of things. And I think it's important to know this. They might even give you a sense I use for job descriptions. My team use for um, a letter or for just to understand leadership for hybrid. The other day was very good. Even well-being, the workplace gave me a strategy. But think about Jet GPT, for example, have access to data until 2021. Of course, there is something missing here. What was? Next slide. The telemarket places didn't show up. I asked how HR can automate things. Nothing about telemarket places. So you need to be attentive to the data reports that you hear in the markets. Everything that people say are all based on surveys. Surveys are based on time. At some time ago, somebody asked people, why well, you're going to invest your money. So I'm a little skeptical of surveys because all these reports, the Workforce of the Future reports, everything leads to the idea that, oh, what's research-based must be science-based. No, be careful. Science-based requires scientific knowledge to make sense of things that you're doing and using. So you can translate with a science background. Reporting on these trends it's just like you ask somebody what they believe in and they told you but it's us asking our neighbors you know that that's not science that's just survey anyway telemarket places if you haven't been engaged you have to because they are evolving very quickly you see you have gloat those are the four top ones lately uh, gloat the eightfold on the bottom left fuel 50 on the bottom right uh, top right and Workday doing their own cloud, skills cloud, and all that. So telemarket places are giving you the hope that actually employees can have at their fingertips the power to choose their next career move. And that's true, because through telemarket places, you can educate your people about the importance of skills, the importance of a skills-based resume, the importance of having a digital brand out there, the importance for us, the company, to have ambassadors out there sharing how how great it is to be here. Actually, the telemarket place is engaging in creating equity and opportunities for people to see what's available in the company, for people to see that skills is really critical for their success, for them to take ownership of their careers, for them to see that actually recommendations are not so scientific. They are just basically giving you ideas on where might you go next. I remember when I was the future of four capabilities uh, for Prudential, many of my team members came from the business. They didn't come from HR because of the town marketplace. So when you think about town marketplace, and I can do another session just on how to be successful in implementing one, because it's not about throwing the capability at people and say, hey, you should be there. It's about educating, listening, starting where they are, at Prudential, for example, we gave uh, a lot of education before we implemented. We even created career services. So you see, HR has to think differently. It's not about processes in nine blocks. It's about how can we meet the employees where they are so they can come this way and we meet in the middle. So town marketplaces is a, is a great thing. Next, this is an important piece. And the, the last slide is the brutal reality of HR. But this one is, if you have to create a strategy, it has to be values driven, has to be a dynamic talent strategy, enabled by this digital architecture and a new HR operating system, not a model. A model is very rigid. You know, you have the COEs, performance management, talent management, they're all in silos. Yeah, we all say that they're under the umbrella of talent, but they are in silos. And the business don't need more silos because they can't comprehend all the silos that we have in HR. So the friction uh, employee experience is about well-being and clarity. So you have these interconnected pieces. And the other day, friends of mine, and I think you hear this a lot, connecting the dots in an organization is the role of HR. <laughs> connecting the dots is the new future skill for HR. Connecting dots, connecting strategy, connecting to the needs of leaders, connecting to the needs of employees, connecting to the marketplace, connecting to skills and careers, connecting to this idea that people only have three years to stay with you. 
So manager capability, I can't emphasize enough because sensing and coaching, that's the role of the manager of the future. They're not there to manage your performance. My team, for example, the previous one was doing work with all the businesses because it was a fungible, very, um, uh, very agile team. And you need managers who are comfortable with that. You're not managing the work itself. You are coaching them for success in their careers, in their work, but you're sensing where your teams are going and sensing the strategy around you to translate that and create an employee experience. Career management, empowerment in learning tools. You, have, you can have the best learning, but it's so confusing to find if you have duplicative learning it's so easy to find learning. So don't think that by finding a library of learning, you're doing something. It needs to be curated. It needs to be accessible. It needs to be connected to the talent marketplace because the skill gaps that you identify there leads you to upskilling. So empowerment comes from you giving the right resources. And that's good for people. They're going to be empowered to follow their, 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 their own career. Strategic workforce planning. Not many people do this right. It's not about the headcount with finance and trying to figure out affordability. It's about skills, talent pools. Where can you get the talent? doesn't need to be full-time all the time. You can get a, a team from a team, for example. It's a company that does UX designers, product design, and accelerates tremendously because you can get the whole team attached to your team in-house. You accelerate the product deployment, and that's how the future is going to work. That's how organizations are going to get ahead. So when you're planning your skills, workforce, do one year, two years, three years, but start thinking about the capabilities of the business, the skills that you need, and the talent pools that you need to pick from. Talent development, analytics, and internal mobility. I think, you know, um, we are talking about sensing and listening. Employee listening is very important, but talent development comes from the ability to have internal mobility. You need to create the space. Because we all have the tools. But if there is no space for people to go to, what happens? They go elsewhere. So we need to create a sense that org design, work design shifting all the time. So organization should be static. You shouldn't have the head of this, the VP of this, the director of this, and it's always static. You should be much more creative about moving your org design to, uh, to come to fruition with these skills and people's capabilities, because then you create move, movement, gig economy is there. You have to create space. Otherwise, there is no mobility. Next, and this is the provocative one. Hang right? on. I want to like pause before you go to your brutal slides. Okay. No, no. So, <laughs> so tell me, tell me what's coming to you. Okay. Like you, you talked about um, like tech, using tech to free up your time with my pen, still analog there. Um, but for anyone watching who is not um, tech or data savvy, mm -hmm. like, is it possible to go into the future without embracing technology? Like, what's, what's your message to those who haven't embraced technology? I love this question. You know why? The enterprises of the future must have technology at scale. Must. You can't have 10,000 people, 30,000, 100,000. IBM has like 350,000. You can't have that population without the support of analytics. But I truly believe all these startups that are being advising, all these small companies, actually you have to focus on one thing and only one thing. How can we build trust in this environment where together we can ignite collective leadership with shared purpose and common goals. Trust is the only way that's going to lead to that conversation about co-creating the future with everyone, being much more open and much more horizontal by having collective leadership be the guidance, share purpose and common goals. I know it's possible. Some companies do this, but you need to work through the emotional impact on leaders who are feeling insecure. The whole idea that you have to support somebody before you ask them to change is a really important concept. You can't ask people to change. And by the way, don't try it. <laughs> when was the last time you made somebody change? You can't. You can't. They got to yeah. do it on their own, right? Yeah, it's your own action. 
it's so funny because these are like basic concepts that you can apply to anything. I mean, right? That's like yes to to evolving to the technology, yes to I mean anything really. Yeah. Like getting some. I love it. I love the conversation. But another thing is, even for people who love technology, like me, I love like trying like new things, AI, AI writers, and things like that. But it can get overwhelming using so many tools, right? For exactly. that. So I love that because that's why you need to design a strategy for HR digital. You can't just go and keep buying things. It's not like that. And and the other thing is. We spend too much time massaging the data because our senior leaders want to see the data to show what they expect to see. You can't rely on data to show what you expect to see. You got to follow the data. Yeah. Yes. Okay, this is a question more, more for us as Erudite, but um, what's your message to the teams that are developing these technologies for HR? Like, how can we ensure that what, like, our tool actually does add value and helps um, HR teams and organizations? No, that's interesting. I, I do think that ethical AI is an important piece. I think many companies are thinking about that, well, how ethical it is to start inferring. Inference is a tricky thing because you're inferring based on something you see. AI can be programmed to be ethical and can be less biased. But we need to be careful because actually it's not about the technology. I see a lot of groups doing incredible technology. It's about understanding how to utilize the output that you receive from that. You have to share. Sharing is a power skill of the future. Leaders who hold close to their vests the information, the financials, everything. They're not building trust. They're not connecting to their people. And actually, they're not benefiting from the energy that's created when people really want to do a great job for you. So I really think it's not about the technology itself. It's about how do you use the outcomes and share much more. Share should be a default, default behavior. And it's not right now, unfortunately. And it's funny because it's, it's AI, it's technology, you think robots, you think flying cars, but at the end of the day, like what makes it great and what makes sure that there's little bias or more bias or whatever is the team, right? Yes. It's like, yes. it, it also depends on the people. So yeah. yeah, I remember like, sorry, I'm like sharing really quick, but Rick, like one of the founders of Erudite was saying, Actually, like with AI, the technology is pretty straightforward. And what we still need to figure out is the human side of it, like how humanity can use it, how humanity has to develop it and things like that. So, But I was telling, okay, being there, we were talking about this. I have one more slide and that's the closing slide. But yeah. you need to understand that using technology to understand employees with the power residing with senior leaders creates the dynamic of power. So employees might be shying away from really integrating their best thoughts, their expression of the self. I think we should allow people to express themselves as a drive that they have. They're going to shy away from being honest, and you're going to create a culture of cynicism, a culture that's very superficial. Leaders must get in the ring, meaning they have to be themselves too. They have to openly discuss their challenges, openly discuss their vulnerability, openly discuss how troubled they are sometimes and the doubts they have about their ability to do things. Because the sharing of that is how we capture the, the language and the sentiment. Employees don't want to see just the sentiment from themselves. They want to see the sentiment of the whole organization. What is the sentiment of our leaders? Why it's so secretive? Right. So and I love the, the direction towards empowerment, like yep. just people empowerment. Okay, yep. I will let you get to okay. <laughs> your brutal slide. <laughs> that is true. The next one is about get a sense of what the people and culture organization is becoming. It's not HR anymore because human resources might not be in the future. Let's put it that way. The people and culture organization is a human-centered ecosystem because ecosystems rely on partners, external, internal. You have to think more broadly about how 
people and culture organizations are operating in systems. Producing value-driven capabilities. So the capabilities you're building is for adding value to the business, your customers, and deliver frictionless employee experiences in a dynamic flow of work for the virtual enterprise. So IBM would just launched the, the virtual enterprise, and actually it's true. The best companies in the world, the biggest companies, are becoming virtual enterprise. What does that mean? It has to be in the flow of work. It needs to be easy. It needs to be frictionless. And actually, the ecosystem you build is to drive value capabilities. So next, and then this is the one that's a little difficult. Did I, oh, you broke in two. The people and culture organization, from HR process, programs, and policies, let go of what's not working. Let go of what is not priority because we focus on processes as if it's going to save the world. It doesn't. We don't share top talent lists. We don't share with people that they are in the, in, the, in the leadership pipeline. We keep doing process on top of process just to feel comfortable that we have names. But senior leadership, of course, succession planning is important. Other than that, I think we need to really engage our managers. Programs. We put programs for diverse people, programs for people. And it's very nice. So there's this program where they're going to have hands-on experience. But what is the outcome? If HR is not ready to do a sustainable long-term strategy for programs, don't do programs because programs are very disappointing when they end. There is no, no outcome. And instead, talk about experiences. Give them projects, experience. Let them do expressions of themselves in jams. Let everybody express themselves. That's the best way forward. And empowerment with what I call success support services. Put people in challenging roles. Put people, instead of pushing them to programs, push them up, not on the side. Push them up and give them what I call success support services because that's important. Um, from HR silo COEs, performance management ratings, why do we still have them? Um, I'm not saying that we should eliminate performance management. I'm saying that we need to train our managers to have continuous conversations. And at the end, having a letter written for them and employees can write their own letters and it works. Nine boxes. Why do we insist in nine boxes? And I give you this question because it's a tricky question. If our nine boxes performance and potential, first of all, do you know what potential means for the future? Second, performance. If we are asking our people to take risks and move not vertically up, but grow their careers horizontally, logically, they're going to go to a career or another role that's challenging. They don't have 100% of the capabilities. They have to build that up, but managers have to give the opportunity. So those individuals who are top talent this year and took the courage to jump to a different line of business or function, they're not going to be top talent in the first year because... They're not going to be the top performers. They are learning, but they took the risk. Those are the top talent that you need, not the nine blocks. Anyway, that's my opinion. So self-nominations have worked for some. Think about this environment. You really broadly announced that you're going to have uh, programs and we are going to have opportunities for people who consider themselves ready for leadership roles, managers, whatever it is. And you ask them, do you have what it takes to be a leader with us? So you put them through an assessment. They raise their hands to go in. They run into accountability, expectations. All this is very clear from the beginning. Many of you, many, many people might opt out. But those who self-nominate are going to be truly energized to be there. Because on the other hand, I've seen this happening all the time. Who are nominated for the programs? Oh, uh, we go to HR partners. They get overwhelmed. They give the list that they gave you last year. So it's always the same people being nominated for the same programs. In over and over, it's the same people because you don't have time to identify them. You know, it's so rushed. Everything's so rushed. So I beg you, slow down. Create a, a, a really reasonable idea of what you want to accomplish. Because it's better. From HR recruiting, reporting, repairing. Um, go to talent access. Start thinking about you don't need all full-time employees. You can have access to employees very quickly. Predictive AI instead of reporting, like I said. And coaching. 
we are not trying to do performance improvement plans because they never worked anyway. I, I don't know any company that does really well. And coaching is a much better skill that can be pervasive in the whole organization. I think I have one more slide. Do I? Ah, is my saying. I love this. Be fully engaged. I know this was overwhelming and we have 10 minutes for questions, but what I say is true. Be engaged because we need to put our energy where we want to be in the flow. Remember, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi is a psychologist who died recently, and he proved that we are in the best state when we are challenged for a, for a mission and are using all our skills to the edge of not being able to do it anymore. So we are in the flow. When everything comes off, you don't think about anything else. You're in the flow of work. That's being engaged. Don't be attached because they just get attachment to programs, policies, and emotionally attached to ideas. That doesn't work. Being emotionally attached, you just close the doors for all the opportunities in your life that could come in. And that goes for your career as well. So I leave you with that. I don't know if you have any questions. We have nine minutes. I have lots of questions. <laughs> okay. There were so many points. I feel like until tomorrow, I'm going to have like aha moments here and there. <laughs> But I love like the new focus of, of HR for the future of like people and organization. And I feel like we're seeing this shift as early as now. I mean, we're yeah. talking more about wellness programs, well-being, Um, are you seeing this shift in the organizations that you're working with? Like, is this actually becoming reality, you think? Janine, I'm, I'm going to be honest. What I'm seeing is that everybody has a question mark behind whatever they are saying they're going to do this year. I don't think anybody knows for sure the pathway to the future, but I think people who are reluctant to see and live in this ambiguity are going to have a hard time because if you think you know just because you're afraid of the ambiguity, you don't know. You're just force-fitting something to feel a little calmer. But the world is anxiety-producing. The world is complex. It's better to have the support of each other through co-creation of the future than trying to push through a door that's already closed. So, like, how do you get leadership In this changing environment, mm. we have to adapt. It's always changing. How do you get them to actually invest oh, I love money this. into so, their people? Oh, I love this. I love this because I forgot to say this. In a stage of so much transformation, transition, and change, everyone is a leader. I used to say in a previous company that during a transformation, leadership is everybody, everyone's business. It is. If you start investing in cultivating leadership skills from the beginning of your career, I'm writing a book about that. It's going to be ready probably by the end of the year, but it's almost ready, but I need to publish because I truly believe in this. Everyone is a leader and you have to cultivate the leadership skills from the beginning of your career because the world has shifted and you now you're a team member who has to have leadership skills to deal with the team dynamic. Self-managed teams, everyone is a leader in a self-managed team. So you need to develop those skills of cognitive mastery, emotional intelligence, the idea that actually you need to be more curious about others to be truly inclusive, understanding the self in all your hang-ups and all the biases that we absorb from socialization all these years. If you're not willing to see that, We are not going to move forward. So organizations need to allow people the space and the time to really have introspective conversations and start having more real conversations. I think that's going to be the future. You've worked with a lot, a lot of managers. We were talking about this before we started. Like, in your experience, like, what percentage is, like, ready? What? ready for, for the future workforce. That's so funny that you say that because in a, when I used to work at IBM, for example, we had manager champions. We selected the best managers that we could find. It was a, a, a really long process to find them. I do believe we have 5% to 10% of managers who are ready because they've been through the journey. Then you have about 20% to 25% of them 
who really want to do a good job, they just don't know where to start. And then you have 50% of managers who are never want to be managers. I think half of the management never want to be management. They are managers because status, compensation, and that's the growth that they suffer themselves. So think about the multi-generational uh, teams that we have today. People have different stages in life, different maturity level, and they got where they got different ways. But I think what's emerging is the managers who wants to do a good job to create an environment, to create an experience, and for themselves to be much more capable of handling coaching and emotional conversations. So I think that's the secret. The secret is to help managers build the capability of connection and the capability of witnessing difficulties without being so absorbed or rushing away from the situation. That's very hard to do. I was trained as a psychotherapist. We are trained to skip boundaries. We are trained to listen. We are trained to be there empathically. Managers never did that. And I think that's the future of HR, by the way. If HR doesn't start up skilling on human behavior, I think we are not going to get there because that's a critical piece that's missing. I have like a two-part question from, from what you just said. One is like, it's, it's complex. It's difficult. It takes years. There are people that have trained for years and still it's difficult, right? So where can leaders start and where can HR start to get on this path? There is something that I truly believe in. Learning happens in the moment. So people said when I had coaching circles, for example, I love the idea of coaching circles. You bring a small number of people together to be in a safe environment to discuss things that they don't usually discuss in classrooms or online. But this creates momentum for people to share, be more comfortable sharing, being themselves, learning from each other. Those aha moments that you talked about happen all the time in coaching circles. In the moment that they are creating that, they are mastering new skills and they are building coaching skills. So to me, it's like experiential learning giving them the space to have those conversations, continue to promote the idea that learning happens through these interactions. I think that's the future. And leaders could benefit from being together in small teams to allow this psychological safety to happen, you know? Nice. We have a question from Richard Lear. Sorry, I, I just saw it now. <laughs> but he says that Talent Value has built a retention and performance platform on a motivation in index. What are your thoughts in capturing and measuring employee motivation versus engagement to predict performance, productivity, and corporate value? Yes. You know, um, there is so many methods out there, you know, for you to assess talent to value and all that. It's great. I do believe in motivation, but motivation is intrinsic. So you need to understand that the experience of each individual has a mystery that we will never find out. There is an intrinsic motivation for all of us, right? We need to have trusting relationships to get to tap into that. It's very hard to tap into intrinsic motivations. Now, external motivations can be so inspiring. I truly believe in that. So motivation in general is the ability that we have to inspire people. Engagement, don't get me started. We only have two minutes. Let me just tell you this about engagement. We're going to have to do another one. For yeah, we do. But, but think about engagement surveys. The results come out. We massage when the message. It takes weeks sometimes. Okay, there is some companies that do it in, in 24 hours. Yes, but people don't know what to do with that data. And then goes to senior leaders first. The senior leaders wants to see what they want to see. So the massaging happens, takes weeks, months. If you are doing this in October or at the end of the year, the year end is going to take over. Nobody's going to action anything on engagement. Then it starts the year. We are talking about, oh, this year we need to strategize for the year. So employees never really see what the company is doing out of giving all this information to them. So I think engagement services are becoming a fallacy in a way. Continuous listening, continuous learning, and continuous understanding of what's motivating the employees. I love the idea. But we need to create something that's natural, 
that there is psychological safety involved and we need to build trust before we do anything else. I love it. We're going to have to wrap up. Yes. But definitely, we'll have more conversations with Wagner. Yes. If there's anything that you want our audience to take away from today, what would that be? You know what? Be kind to yourselves and be grateful for the opportunity for us to have this conversation, to even think about these things. I do know that we are all anxious about things that we need to do. There's so much turmoil with layoffs and so many things happening with loved ones indeed. But if you can be focused on being uniquely you, be you. Because what you transpire is going to be much more valuable than trying to pretend that you're in control. Lovely parting words, Wagner. Thank you so, so much for lending us your time and your thought-provoking ideas today. <laughs> uh, we hope everyone came away with some new ideas and strategies for building a happier, more productive workforce for the future. So don't forget to follow us and follow Wagner on LinkedIn for updates and for future events and more ideas and insights on the future of work and HR. Um, and... Yeah, before we go, I'd also like to invite everyone who's working in the field of HR to help us make Erudite's workforce insights more actionable by answering a really, really quick survey. We are not pro-survey, but we do need your feedback to make our insights more actionable and to improve our platform. So we'll send that in the chat. And that's it. That's a wrap on Erudite Shockwave Talks, the future of HR. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Wagner. Thank you.